Hello, and welcome to my series on the CT of Pediatric Emergencies. I'm Dr. Benjamin Strong, the Chief Medical Officer of Virtual Radiologic, or VRAD. I began my career with an internal medicine residency, followed by three years of work as an emergency room physician. I then returned to training for a radiology residency and a fellowship in body and MSK MRI. In my over 20 years in radiology, I have spent two years in private practice, two years in academics, and 17 years now as a teleradiologist for Virtual Radiologic. I've been their chief medical officer for eight years, and I'm licensed to practice in all 50 states. I have divided our curriculum into general systems, and have created three sessions of eight cases each. So we'll begin with the thoracic emergencies. And our first case is of non-accidental trauma. Certainly this is something everyone will see uh, many times in their career. A life-saving diagnosis, as my pediatric attending used to tell me, uh, miss a pneumonia, and that patient will likely return to the ER miss a rib fracture, and that patient likely won't. So here is a classic example, multiple rib fractures in different stages of healing. You can see in the left uh, lateral ribs there, there is significant callus formation around a subacute uh, fracture. Posteriorly, there are overlapping acute fractures adjacent to a different healing fracture as well. When we see the video, we'll see the extent of all this. The posterior fractures are particularly prevalent and they're present at almost every upper thoracic level. And then, of course, that uh, exuberant callus there in the left lateral rib is pretty telling as well. So that is a definite case of non-accidental trauma, uh, the reporting of which is, of course, required in most states. Our next case is a large cavitary lesion in the right upper lobe with a fluid level and a very thick wall. I think when you see this degree of cavitation, an irregular thickened wall, layering fluid, it's pretty clearly going to be an infectious process. A large unilocular abscess such as this, my old attendings always told me, think staph. Now, of course, that kind of profile will change with time, and many of these have multiple infectious agents identified, but mentioning at least Staphylococcus as a differential possibility will frequently be helpful. So here it is on the coronal as well. You can see the layering fluid very nicely there. So that is a case of a Staphylococcal abscess. Our next case is an acute asthma attack. There is frequently bronchial mucus plugging associated with asthma attacks. And as a result, it will cause atelectasis of lung segments or even entire lobes. In addition, the extreme negative pleural pressures generated in air hunger can cause acute spontaneous pneumothorax. So that's what we have in multiple locations here. You can see there is a pneumothorax here in the left anterior hemithorax. In addition, there is atelectasis of both the right middle lobe and the left upper lobe, near complete, in fact. And there you can see that pneumothorax. That type of pneumothorax adjacent to an atelectatic upper lobe can be a very difficult call on x-ray as it presents with a, uh, an edge as opposed to a typical line. So I have that in my plain film uh, session as well and think it can be challenging. So here it is on the coronal. There is the pneumothorax. A little bit of air bronchogram formation in the left upper lobe suggesting that perhaps that mucus plug is resolving. But there is a completely atelectatic 
right middle lobe and a left upper lobe with pneumothorax. So that is an acute asthma attack with atelectasis and pneumothorax. Our next case is a pulmonary sequestration in a patient with situs inversus. So there is the dextrocardia, and lower down we'll see a right upper quadrant spleen and a midline liver. But more importantly, there is a multiloculated collection of gas and fluid, which for all the world could look like a necrotic pneumonia. But here is the critical uh, cut that tells us it's not just a pneumonia. Again, note the midline liver and the right upper quadrant spleen, consistent with situs inversus, and the gas and fluid collection here in the left lower lobe. But again, the most important finding here is the systemic arterial supply, a large vessel coming from the descending aorta, and clearly giving a systemic arterial supply to this region, consistent with an extra lobar type sequestration. So there's the sequestration, and here is that all-important systemic arterial supply. So the presence of all those fluid levels will lead you to suggest that there is extensive superinfection, a common complication of sequestrations. Here it is on the coronal, again the gas and fluid collections, and they're just the origin of that systemic arterial supply. And farther back, again, fluid and gas collections. And there is that systemic supply. So that is an infected sequestration in a patient with situs inversus. Our next case is a meconium ileus in a cystic fibrosis patient. So in the lung bases, you can see bronchiectasis. A great rule is you should not see the lumen of bronchi in the peripheral third of any lung lobe. So here they're obviously present right out to the periphery, along with wall thickening uh, suggestive of chronic bronchiectasis. Here in the abdomen, the telltale finding of cystic fibrosis, extensive fatty infiltration of the pancreas with essentially no residual pancreatic parenchyma identifiable. And another complication of cystic fibrosis is of course meconium ileus, very dense inspissated stool is present throughout both the colon and small bowel obviously a treatment challenge getting rid of this. So here is the bronchiectasis in the lung bases. And now we'll move on to the pancreatic fatty infiltration. Really no pancreatic parenchyma remaining. And now look at the extent of that inspissated stool you can see uh, effectively a, a plug there in the sigmoid with decompression of the rectum. So reasonable to call an associated distal colonic obstruction here. So again, all that inspissated stool, and look right there, a caliber transition from sigmoid to rectum. So that is a case of meconium ileus in a cystic fibrosis patient. Our next case is a Marfan syndrome with the dread complication of aortic dissection. So note the dilation of the aortic root and the telltale intimal flap denoting a dissection. There is the top portion of the dissection. And here we pick it up again in the ascending aorta in a number of locations. It's absolutely critical that you evaluate every dilated aorta in a known Marfan's patient. These can be extremely subtle, and they are an extremely common complication. 
An additional thing I've noticed over the years in Marfan's patients is the deformity of the anterior ribs. You note that asymmetry and tilt of the sternum and the distortion of the anterior ribs here. It's a finding I haven't seen described anywhere, but that uh, I have come to associate with Marfan syndrome. And so that is a Marfan syndrome with an acute aortic dissection. Our next case is a Takayasu arteritis. This was in an 18-year-old female, common in young women, uh, often involving the descending aorta with wall thickening and periaortic density, as you see here. There is variation in the caliber of the descending aorta, which varies between narrowing and dilation, as you see there. There is no specific lab value uh, that can definitively diagnose Takayasu arteritis, and so it is essentially a matter of excluding other potential causes. So that is a case of Takayasu arteritis. Our next case is a relatively acute Kawasaki disease. You see here the telltale coronary artery aneurysms. The interesting thing about this case is most of the Kawasaki disease I have seen have calcified aneurysms. You rarely catch it early enough in the course of the disease to actually see this coronary dilation without calcification. So this is uh, at the latest a subacute Kawasaki disease. You see it involving the right coronary here as well. Large aneurysm there. And on the cine, you'll first see that LAD and circumflex dilation, and then that right coronary. Pretty dramatic. We'll let that play one more time. Again, the calcified aneurysm, uh, far and away in my experience, the most common manifestation of Kawasaki. So this is a fairly unusual case, most likely uh, just because we got it in the right time course with subacute imaging rather than delayed. So that is a case of Kawasaki disease. And so that concludes our first session, Pediatric Thoracic Emergencies. Thanks for watching.